Hi, this is Roland Fisher, lead pastor of Second City Church, and we hope that you're well. Welcome to our online service. We hope you leave today encouraged, full of faith, and ready to take the kingdom of God wherever you may go. Before we get started today, let's consider this our lobby moment where we have an opportunity to get to know one another. If you would, please share your name and maybe from where you might be worshiping with us today. In just a moment here, you'll see a countdown letting us know that worship is about to begin, and you can prepare your heart during that time. But we just wanted you to know that we're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. And once again, welcome. Second City Church, thank you all for joining us today. Let's worship together. Oh, 
you, Lord, for being so faithful to us, God. When it feels like the dark lingers longer than the night, shadows feel like giants. Are you chasing
and welcome to Second City Church. My name is Anthony and I'm an intern here with Second City. Now before we get started with announcements, please take a moment to invite someone to the live stream right now. Also, if you need prayer for anything at all during our service, please click the live prayer button and we'd be honored to pray with you for anything you might need. Now our vision here at Second City Church is threefold. It's Christ, community, and culture. We exist here in the city to worship Jesus Christ as Lord, to share life together in community, and to be empowered to impact our culture by bringing the kingdom of God to every sphere of influence. Here are some practical ways you can get connected. First is Christ. At the end of today's service, you're going to see a chat prompt to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Please click this link so that we can connect with you and help you get started in your walk in this new life with Jesus. The second way is by joining a community group. If you haven't already, please check out our website and find a community group. We have several of those that meet throughout the city at various times and locations. The third way you can get involved is culture. Go to our website, click the culture tab, and find all the ways that you can engage our culture with the good news of Jesus Christ and bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Now for announcements, first Friday fast and prayer will take place this Friday, July 2nd, at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Next week, Sunday, July 4th, we're going to have Church on the Hill outside of Lincoln Park High School. So please come out and join us for a time of worship in person. Please take advantage of this. We're going to meet in front of the auditorium at Lincoln Park High School at 10 a.m. Now, we will be abiding by CDC guidelines. So please wear a mask if you have not yet been fully vaccinated. Now water baptisms will take place next Sunday, July 11th. If you would like to learn more about taking this next step of faith, please sign up on the church center or talk to one of our pastors. Now Build Conference is fast approaching. It's going to be July 12th through 15th and it will take place in Orlando, Florida. Now come join Every Nation's North America Build Conference as we focus on our theme, Awesome God. Together we'll deepen our understanding of God's greatness and His goodness, and as we fix our eyes on who God is, we aim to grow in worship, holiness, and mission with our nationwide church family. Now if you're interested in attending, please register as soon as possible and let us know. By letting us know, every nation can know if we need to have more hotel rooms allocated to the conference. Now our Madison, Wisconsin summer missions trip will take place July 30th and 31st. Answer God's call in Acts 1-8 to go and be his witnesses to our neighboring region and to the ends of the earth. Sign up on Church Center or go through the website if you'd like more information. Now moving to a time of tithes and offering. We've been going through this summer multiple passages in the Old Testament and right now we land in 2 Kings 22:17, which says this, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. As we see here, what we give our money and resources to matters to God. When we return to God what he has entrusted to us, we can have peace for us and our households. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your abundant blessings, for your goodness, for um, saving us and bringing us into communion with yourself. And Father, I just ask that you would bless this tithe and offerings for the furtherance of your kingdom, that you would multiply it a hundredfold for the advancement of the gospel. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to move into a time of uh, worship through the sermon. Amen. All right, all right. We are again are so glad that you're here with us today. And again, we are ho so hopeful that you are blessed by that worship set. Now, today what we're doing is we're actually beginning a new series. And this new series is actually going to be entitled Thrive. Because more than just surviving the past year and a half as we're coming out of um, the pandemic, our political cycle, and all that's come along with it, 
What we want to do is get to a place as the people of God, as the unified, diverse, loving people of God to a place where we're actually thriving in God. And so today we're going to actually start a new series, which is going through the life of Isaac, who was the promised child of Abraham and Sarah, the patriarchs of the faith, who were actually the patriarch and matriarch of the faith, who were actually giving us um, the faith on which we stand today, as it was um, ultimately a precursor to all that would come through Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at Genesis over the next several weeks, looking at the life of Isaac and really setting that up as a model of how God was bringing his people to a place of thriving in him. And so today's subtitle is going to be called Thriving in God's perfect timing. Thriving in God's perfect timing. Because ultimately what we need to do is ask ourselves, has this year ultimately been a waste or simply a bust? Have we lost a sense of the call of God during that time? And is there in fact a way to get back on on track to once again thrive in the life and purposes of God? Is there a way to do that? Now, we're going to answer these questions today by looking at the life of Abraham on the verge of receiving his son Isaac after many years of waiting on God's promise to be fulfilled. We're going to dig into a few words that Jesus expressed about his kingdom. And then finally, the understanding it gave the Apostle Paul in regards to that kingdom. So our focus statement is going to be this today, that we will thrive in every season when we embrace the perfect timing of God. That we will thrive in every season of our lives when we embrace the perfect timing of God. We're going to break the message into three parts today. We're going to talk about lost time. We're going to talk secondly about the fact that you've not missed it. And then finally, we're going to talk about the perfect timing of God. So before we do anything else, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us today. And we thank you that you've given it to us to encourage us. That you said everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scripture, we might have hope. So God, would you give us great hope today in your perfect timing, all expressed through the work and will, the eternal purposes of Jesus Christ, your son, in his mighty name. Amen. All right, so let's talk first about lost time. What we need to understand is that we will begin to thrive when we realize that time we thought lost was actually useful to God. We will begin to thrive when we realize that time that we thought lost was actually useful to God. And what we see is that as we're looking at this life of Abraham, the patriarch of the faith, Father Abraham, who had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's just Right. Thank the Lord. What we need to do is see that Abraham started this whole journey of faith when he was 75 years old. Yet in between that promise being given and where we pick up in the story that we're going to read today, Abraham could have had moments of questioning God's sovereignty. But years later, the Apostle Paul would affirm the fact that even though you have to wait on the promises of God, and it seems like lost time as you're doing so many times, what we see is that the gifts and the calling of God, even during that time, are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, and this is what Abraham and his wife Sarah would see. So let's read in Genesis 21, starting in verse 1 today, talking about lost time. It says, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me, which is, in fact, what the name Isaac means. For everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. 
And so what we see is that over the, uh, the years, we, we see that in Genesis chapter 12, God met with Abraham and he gave him this great promise that he was going to be the father of many nations. But in between this time of uh, Genesis 12, where God had given Abraham this promise at 75 years old, and uh, this point at which we're picking up the story today when Isaac finally arrives on the scene, it's a period of 25 years. 25 years. And I know that this past year and a half was a challenging year and it seemed like it was even a lost year for many of you feeling like uh, you lost a sense of self, you lost a sense of directions, many of you lost a sense of time and orientation, even in life, wondering what day it was. Was anybody ever, did anyone find yourselves over the past year in that state, waking up and saying, what day or even week, month are we in? Well, that's what Abraham could have felt like in his long 25-year period of waiting on the promise of God. But what we see is that God is, in fact, using uh, the times that we feel like are lost when we uh, recognize what he's doing, not only behind the scenes, but in us as we wait on him. And preparing to thrive begins with really coming to a place where we thank God for what he's already given us rather than what we don't have. Now, the first thing that God wants to do in us is thank him for what we already have in him rather than what we don't have. Because if we're going to come to a place of thriving, ultimately we need to be a people who can recognize our blessings and be thankful for that which God has already done for us. We won't be always sour for what we don't have or what we feel like we're missing if we can recognize and rejoice in God for what he's already given us. And what God had given Abraham and uh, what Abraham uh, God had given Sarah was spouses that were ultimately devoted to God and one another. And they were able to celebrate those, uh, the, the, a couple, um, as a couple of faith, a faith that they had in common and that they were running after God hard together and that God had given them specific promises that would ultimately be fulfilled at God's perfect time. And Abraham, though he was blessed um, um, with a wife, he was also, what the scripture says, blessed financially. He was blessed societally, and he was actually well regarded by the people of the land in which he was sojourning. But what we see is that he still lacked one of the deepest needs for the human soul to be fulfilled, which was ultimately the need to build a family. And God was letting Abraham know that to truly thrive, to truly thrive, it wouldn't be something that Abraham and Sarah had to do on their own, meaning build a family, a family lineage on their own. But to truly thrive, God would give Abraham and Sarah a family that the Lord himself would build for them. And this is the same blessing that continues today as we are all, when we belong to Jesus, part of the capital C, Universal Church of Jesus Christ. I love our Second City Church family, but I thank God that Second City is part of the broader ministry of every nation and also a part of the capital C, Universal Church of Jesus Christ, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord actually belongs to that family. And what we see is that though we can have periods where we feel like times are lost in us, you are never wasting time when you are building God's family in Christ. You see, because we can always be doing that. That even though circumstances may be challenging or circumstances may be difficult, we can always be building that which God is building, which is his family in Jesus Christ. And everyone who belongs to Jesus is a part of that family and a lineage that far precedes and will far exceed them in every way. It is not that you can't survive without a strong attachment to family. And that was the challenge over the past year, right? Is that the relationships that were meant to be God-given, God-built, and God-ordained often were challenged and many of them were severed. And people began to convince themselves that, you know what, I'm fine without that family that God is trying to build or provide for me. 
But the truth of the matter is, is that it's not that you can't survive without a strong family attachment to family, whether naturally or spiritually, but it's that you will not thrive as Christ intends for you to thrive, bereft of the fundamental need that God has given you for family, both naturally and spiritually, to do what? To define you, to shape you, to strengthen you, and to bring you into the multi-generational purposes of God. You see, when you thrive, that's your sweet spot. That's where you're living. You're not just living for the moment. You're not just living for the next paycheck or the next experience or excursion or thrill, which ultimately are highs and sugar crashes that come down but you're ultimately living in your sweet spot, sweet spot for the multi-generational purposes of God. Why? Because family is God-given, both naturally and spiritually. This is what Abraham um, learned. And what you feel like you are missing naturally, God will always exceedingly provide for you with spiritual family in Christ. You see several scriptures rec um, um, referenced in the notes that the Theologically, even, the first natural family is to be ultimately your base and all the benefits and potential failings of Adam follow. That we have a natural sense of belonging and camaraderie, a sense of identity and a sense of common history, right? But you also have the common trappings of, uh, of Adam as well, meaning the dysfunction or the sins that precede family lines along natural ends. The second family, though, which should include the first, meaning that you should have your natural families as also, Lord willing, part of the family of God in Christ, redeemed by Christ as well. What we see in when we're giving ourselves, even during challenging times and times that we thought would otherwise be lost to building God's spiritual family, is that it should be ex expression of not just the first man who was Adam, but the second man, as 1 Corinthians 15 talks about it, who is Christ, and be intentionally reflective of his redemptive gospel purposes, meaning that the family you're giving yourself to building is your natural family, grafting them into the spiritual family of Christ. But also, even if you don't have a natural family, the extended spiritual family that God's given you in Christ Jesus is one that should reflect the gospel purposes of Christ. Now, this is theologically, I want you to follow me here just for a little bit. This is a bit of what Isaac represented. And Isaac is the bridge. When we're talking about thriving, Isaac is the bridge between Abraham, his father, who was the patriarch, and Jacob, who would be otherwise known as Israel, who uh, of whom for whom, rather, modern-day Israel is actually named. Jacob, his son, Isaac is the bridge between the two. And Isaac is basically the link between hearing the promises of God and beginning to see the first fruits of those promises actually manifest in your life. You might feel like you hit a rut or that you had times that were lost or unproductive because of things like we came out of in this past year. But when we look at how God moves over a period of time, what we see is that God wants to bring forth Isaacs in our lives. Isaacs in our lives that are that link between when he made the promise and seeing the first fruits, the first glean, the first indication that God will actually be faithful to filling the promises that he made to us in his word through Christ. And Isaac would represent the stage between taking the first steps of faith towards God's promise and seeing the manifest momentum of that promise. Once you see Jacob start having children, he had the 12 tribes of Israel, which would ultimately multiply in Egypt when they went down to Egypt prior to their enslavement there. And even in their enslavement, they would multiply, becoming a mighty nation that Moses would eventually go down and speak to Pharaoh and deliver and bring out of Egypt in their slavery into the promised land of God. Not just being a promised nation, but that promised nation would come into the promised land of God. And Isaac was the first fruits, the first steps of faith to seeing that Abraham, though you had to wait, none of your time was lost. I was using it all. And God is going to fulfill the promises that he made for you.
God made them a promise with its foundation and his purposes ultimately to bring salvation to the world, not just through the promised son Isaac, but ultimately theologically through the promised son, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was part of the natural lineage of Abraham and all the years of trial and all the years of discipline and all the years of even the diaspora and the wanderings that we see in the Old Testament leading up to the new was all leading to ultimately that promise of all nations being blessed through the seed of Abraham that would come not just through Isaac, but through Isaac's lineage in Jesus Christ. Abraham again received the promise though to receive, um, to have that child Isaac when he was 75 years old. And Sarah, his wife, was no spring chicken either. She was 90, 90 when she re received the, um, the uh, supernatural intervention of God to be able to have the baby. And Isaac was finally born when Abraham was 100 years old, a supernatural miracle. And so what can we learn from these seemingly lost years or lost times when Abraham might have been waiting and feeling like I'm, I'm just in a, a circular pattern and I don't know what's going on with my times or what I'm supposed to be doing or what's really being produced out of it. Well, what this tells us is that whether a child of destiny like Isaac or feeling past your prime like Abraham and Sarah did when they finally had Isaac, the truth of the matter is that God says your times aren't wasted, that you have a call in God to fulfill today. And what that means is that what you are doing now, even if you feel like you're still trying to get your traction underneath you to get to a place of thriving after this past year, what you're doing now and even what you were doing in the pandemic matters. What you do from this point going forward matters. You are where you are at the stage of life you are doing what you are doing with whom you are doing it for God to ultimately demonstrate, just as he did with Abraham and Sarah, the power of his Holy Spirit through your life. And just as Isaac's birth was a miraculous testimony to everyone who surrounded Abraham and Sarah, you are where you are in the stage of life you are to reach the people who surround you with the good news of God's Son, Jesus Christ. As Isaac was born, we see that God's promise to make Abraham a mighty nation through which all nations on the earth would be blessed was evidence to Abraham that though many years of unfulfilled longing had passed, he had not missed the purposes of God. And so when we look back over our past year and a half with 2020 hindsight, the question is, how can you see that God has been using time that you thought was lost? How has God been using the time that you thought was lost? Maybe you feel like you are still in a waiting period, but how is God using, just like in Abraham and Sarah's case, time that you felt like was lost. The truth is, is that you haven't missed it. And we will begin to thrive when we begin to recognize what God is doing in our period of waiting. As you love Jesus and obey his commands, God, you need to understand this, is with you in the waiting. You've not been abandoned. You've not been forgotten about. You've not been left behind. But just like Abraham and Sarah in that those 25 years of waiting, God is with you in the waiting as well. So what did Abraham and Sarah learn during their time of waiting? Well, I think that they learned at least three things, understanding that they had not missed it. Number one, they understood and they learned that the call of God on their lives was more than just about their personal comfort, fulfillment, or even their dreams. That the call of God on their lives was more than just about their personal fulfillment, comfort, or dreams. And I think that's what many of us had to come to grips with over this past year and a half of the pandemic, right? 
that God wanted to do something more than just uh, than just allow me to find comfort in my daily surroundings or in my habitat or uh, things otherwise, my job or my relationships. God wanted to do something bigger and eternal to boot. Number two, what Abraham and Sarah learned was that the promise of God in their lives was to reveal their son and by lineage, God's son, Jesus Christ. That ultimately the call of God on your life is ultimately like in the case of Abraham and Sarah and like in the lineage that came from Isaac, it's ultimately to reveal Jesus through your life. So that the circumstances that you face, you are facing so that ultimately you might meet Jesus and then ultimately he might be revealed in and through your life. And then number three, we also see that Abraham and Sarah learned that the purpose of God's delay in their lives was to demonstrate his miraculous power. You see, they had to get to the age of 90. They had to get to the age of 100 to allow God to intervene in a miraculous way so that literally our faith is in a God of miracles now. Why? Because the very inception of the great nation of Israel that brought forth the Messiah, that brought forth the church of Jesus Christ, came by God's miracle hand working on, a ba- on behalf of people who were past their physical prime. And the reason that's important is because what God's doing and the waiting in your life is setting you ultimately up for a miracle as well. A miracle, maybe not that you would have chosen, a miracle, maybe not that would have been by your design, but a miracle nonetheless that shows God's goodness, his power, his strength, and his grace towards you and wants to show through you to others in your life. And in our modern cultures, we are often too self-focused. But Abraham's life, on the other hand, was lived in humble devotion as he worked his business, led his family, and sought the face of God. What we don't want to do, though, is we we don't want to uh, be so consumed with the constant tide of our day that we miss the will of God because of our romanticized picture of destiny because we're so focused on ourselves. As Abraham intentionally walked with God, he did not miss the purposes of God for his life or family, though nothing visibly ostentatious came from it for 75 recorded years until God met him at age 75 in Genesis chapter 12. And what you need to know is that you are not missing it. You're not missing it when you are... Well, if where you are is faithfully seeking Jesus, loving your family, church, and community, making disciples with the opportunities where you find yourself today. God used all of that time to prepare for the nation of Israel, the coming of this Messiah, and again, ultimately the birth of Jesus Christ. And God uses our waiting to develop character, perseverance, and the strength of Christ in us. It's not what we always would choose, but it's what God uses, and you're not missing it. If you're looking at what you don't have, rather, rather than what you do, you will miss God's program for utilizing what he's already given you. You'll miss God's program for utilizing what God's already given you. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that what you have the opportunity to do today is in fact the will of God for your life. If you're like me, I'm always thinking about the next thing. Anybody else like that? I'm always thinking about what we're going to do five or 10 years from now, where, where, what the uh, next outreach is going to be, what's the next church plant going to be, what's the next nation that God wants to move in, what is that next thing that he wants to do. But if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, what can happen is that we can miss today's opportunities as the will of God, where you find yourself today. And what you need to understand is you are not missing life or your destiny if you are faithful to live a godly life, seek the Lord, and make disciples today. The opportunity that you have right now is the place, will, and call of God for you. The place where you are right now today is the will 
the call and the place that God has for you today. Now, how faithful you are with these daily opportunities ultimately determines the measure to which God opens up others for you. And you don't want to forsake your future harvest by despising what God has given you to cultivate today. That's why he said in Proverbs chapter 28, 19, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, thriving. But he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. And the point here is that God is referring to the land that you have today. You're not missing it. He's saying work the land you have today. What's in front of you? What relationships has he given you to cultivate today? Whether it be in your home, your marriage, your children, whether it be in your church community, whether it be in your workplace or in your community at large, God's saying, what has he given you today to cultivate? Do not, do not only think about inheriting something in the future at the expense of cultivating your land today. The internet, the boasting of social media and our, inter uh, our entertainment today fill us with fantasies. Fantasies devoid of the posture of devotion to God, hard work, and perseverance required to attain the very things that our hearts long for. That is why some of us feel like over this past year, it was a waste because we couldn't attain those things rather than working what was right in front of us. Whether though it be in regards to marriage, parenting, your career, or ministry calling, you have not missed anything God intended for you if you remain in step with him. You need to realize that and then you need to embrace that. What God is doing in the waiting is building perseverance and strength to fulfill the call of God and his people. And this is why there was an anonymous quote. We don't actually know the uh, author, but they said this. Behind every strong person, it's a story that gave them no other choice. Behind every strong person is a story that gave them no other choice. And Jesus, as the Son of God himself, would not begin his ministry until after 30 years of obscurity, working faithfully in a tiny town called Nazareth in a small nation of Israel. And it's from this place, and in the perfect timing of the Father, at a time that the world had been connected in new and significant ways through the Roman Empire, that Jesus would begin his worldwide discipleship campaign to save the nations. And think about how he's brought the world together, even virtually, over this past year and a half for the increased spread of his gospel, allowing nothing to be wasted. It was not lost. We did not miss it. It's God moving forward in strength. And every fulfilled work of God ultimately begins with a seed. After years of barrenness, Abraham had to continue to sow seeds of faith with his wife, Sarah, for Isaac, his son, to be born. That is where many of us are today, needing to learn to sow seeds of faith, even after feeling like a year has been lost, needing to sow seeds of faith, not fear, but faith, to see the first fruits of the promises of God actually begin to manifest. And the priorities and focus of your life need to be that seed offered in sacrifice to God. Now, we say this because Jesus himself was actually uh, ministering you know, during his earthly ministry, and he says something profound when he said in John 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. This is Jesus speaking prior to his betrayal by Judas and his crucifixion at the cross. He said in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. 
Then a voice from he um, came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He, meaning Jesus, said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And many times God is teaching us through circumstance that we need to, like Jesus, be that seed. Not just sow a seed, but be that seed. Be that seed to learn to die to ourselves and our selfishness before we can truly live. And Jesus clearly expressed over and over again that the kingdom of God is the only thing, the only thing for what, that we would pursue that truly endures. We begin to truly thrive when we anchor ourselves in eternal rather than temporary things. And many of us, though we need to rehabilitate from the social anxiety produced over this past year to relate in healthy manners in the world again, <coughs> excuse me, even as we do, we must acknowledge that what is constant is that our circumstances change. You see, if you're just holding on, we're coming out of this um, pandemic and saying, listen, I'm going to get to a place where I'm thriving again. And then once again, I'm going to have so much control over my life that nothing's going to change again. I'm going to hold everything so tightly that it won't ever have the ability to change again. That will ultimately prove to be an unreality for you. Life is finite and loves will be lost as even the people nearest and dearest to us inevitably age and pass away. What God is trying to give us, though, what God is trying to give us is the perspective that what he gives us is eternal and that which cannot be shaken, stolen, or faded. So, so there. And when we embrace the fact that God will lovingly use all things to press us into a healthy dependence on him and a focus on his eternal kingdom, we will interpret our times correctly and continually and continually thrive, understanding that as we're in step with him, we've not missed a thing. Because ultimately, it's about his kingdom purposes. And not just about his kingdom purposes, but them coming about in his perfect timing. And we will thrive in our lives when we acknowledge that God's perfect timing is meant to ultimately reveal and form Christ in us. The perfect timing of God is ultimately meant to reveal and form Christ in us. That's what Abraham and Sarah learned, and ultimately that's what the Apostle Paul came to recognize. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, he ultimately was talking about the coming of Christ and how Christ came in that Roman Empire at the perfect time to do God's perfect will. And he said this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that, that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave a slave to sin, a slave to death, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And we see that just as he sent Christ into the world at the perfect time in that Roman Empire so that the gospel of Christ following that Roman road could wrap itself around the world so his grace and goodness might be shown to the nations. Even so, Though he wait, the, the Israelites who had been promised a Messiah had to wait for centuries for that Messiah to come. At God's perfect time, he came as a deliverer, not just for them, but for us too. Not just for us, but for the whole world and all who would believe that they might turn to him and actually see in God's perfect timing the work of God to save and deliver them from the sin and Satan that held them captive prior to his coming. 
God is always perfect in his timing to accomplish his kingdom purposes. And it's why A.W. Tozer said this, God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this is to quiet our spirits and relax our nerves. And so we need to remind ourselves again that there's been no time lost, that number two, that you have not missed it, and number three, God's timing is ultimately perfect. And just as Abraham and Sarah had to reach the limits of their physical capacities to truly enter into the miracle life of God, so let us meet Jesus, our Christ, at the cross today, so that by repentance and faith in his in God's perfect timing, we might thrive as we submit to God's greater purposes for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And so today, I want to invite anyone who's not made a decision yet to serve Jesus as Lord. Because here's what the Bible says, ultimately, that in the perfect timing of God, all of our lives will end one day and all of us will have to answer to God in judgment for the lives that we've lived. And if we've lived selfishly in rebellion to God in our own desires and sins to the detriment of others and in disobedience to the commands of God, God will have to judge us and send us to hell. And it will be what we deserve, but that is the very reason that Jesus Christ came to live the perfect life that you and I should have lived, to on the cross die in God's perfect timing, the sacrificial death that you and I should have died so that we might not receive death, but forgiveness of sins and new life in God. And if you know you stand at odds with God today and want to come into right relationship with him, would you pray this prayer with me? Almighty God, I admit to you today that I'm a sinner and I admit that I deserve death and hell because of my sin but I ask you today to forgive me. I acknowledge that Jesus lived the perfect life for me, died sacrificially on the cross for my sins, and rose three days later from the dead so I could have new life in him. God, I say, I repent. I turn away from my sin today. I confess Jesus as Lord and ask you to make me a new creation. Help me to love you and follow you with all my days from this point forward in Jesus' name, amen. The good news is, is if you prayed that prayer, God said he'd made you a new creation. In his perfect timing, today he's made you a new creation. So would you go with me to our website, secondcitychurch.com slash new life. There you can find not only next steps, but also resources to help you thrive in this new life in God. And for the rest of us, let's go back honoring the one who loves us so and in his perfect timing will fulfill his precious and great eternal promises for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's worship, get back into worship.
Right. We hope that you were encouraged by that last worship set and are once again filled with the strength that comes from the knowledge of God's great love for you. We're going to continue to talk about these matters this week in our community groups. And so if you've not yet been able to find one, please do visit our website where you can find both in-person and virtual options. We'll be praying for you this week, so let us know how we can be standing with you in prayer. And do think about how you can share this link with family members, coworkers, and friends who also need to be encouraged by the grace of God. Please do think about which one of them you can invite with you to our service next week. And until then, have a great week in the Lord. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you soon.